Hey, listen up. Everyone Loves Guitar listeners can now get 20% off all merchandise at guitarmerch.com. Just enter the discount code VIDEO in your shopping cart and enjoy. Get your Everyone Loves Guitar t-shirts, hoodies, and mugs, as well as other cool music and guitar t-shirts. Just enter VIDEO as your discount code for 20% off at guitarmerch.com. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I got such a lovely, awesome guest with me today with uh, Sugar Ray Rayford. Uh... Um, he, he's just an awesome guy. I've spent a lot of time with him, and he's an extremely talented blues soul singer. Uh, quickly, I want to thank Patty DeVries for hooking us up. Patty, thank you very much. Thanks, Patty. Little, yep, I'm going to give you a little background on Ray, and then we'll get into it. Ray's a blues and soul artist, singer, and songwriter. He was born in Smith County, Texas. He what? started singing in church at age seven. He's released six albums. He's won two blues music awards, including the B.B. King Entertainer of the Year and the Soul Blues Male Artist of the Year. His 2019 album called Somebody Save Me was nominated for a Grammy. And as a studio vocalist, Ray sang the theme for Judge Joe Brown and the trailer for the movie City Lights, and he, as well as other studio vocal work. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've been looking forward to talking. We you already had an interview and a half already, but I've been looking yeah, forward to <laughs> hanging out with you, man. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. No, um, man. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, man. My pleasure. So I have no idea if this is true and to what extent is true, but I read that you had a rough childhood. Your mom passed and you were very young, but then you and you had three brothers, so it was four of you, ultimately wound up living with your grandmother. But she had an incredibly positive impact on you. So to whatever extent you're comfortable, Ray, can you talk about that period of time as far as what happened and how this did impact you? Well, you know, it, actually, there's only three of us. It's me and okay. my two brothers. And, two uh, brothers, okay. And, and, and it, it's really weird. It's, you know, because everybody grows up tough. But, I mean, it was bad. I and mean, we were living in uh, Oak Cliff in West Dallas at the time. And... A lot of times we would go on sometimes five to seven days without anything to, to eat, especially in the summertime when, when we were in that school, getting the free school lunch program. Uh, but, you know, off and on, I had to always move back and forth to, to Tyler with my grandmother. And so it, at some point, my mother took me to Tyler, spoke for a visit, and just uh, left me. And I was there for three, four years. And, uh, you know, very young, so I didn't even think about, like, where my brothers were. Come to find out some years later that my mother had left them with some people we didn't know. And, you know, oh they got kind God. of abused really bad. And, and we still don't know what was going on with my mom. Uh, you know, but... Uh, shit. Does she have, like, some a, point, she have drugs all, and yeah, drugs You know, yeah, I'm assuming, yeah. but, that, yeah. you know, again, I was young, and I never saw that, never saw her really drunk or anything, but I'm assuming that... <clears throat> you know that was that must have been uh, you know it was the seventies you know so it's it's kind of you know it's wow. been an assumption you know and you know you know I have my brother's permission you know my brother's permission to talk about it we're all really really close and uh, but having said that um, you know I was living off and on in Tyler with my grandmother um, which is about eighty seven miles east of Dallas uh, out in the country eighty seven miles east of Dallas is probably about eighty miles. Uh, East of Louisiana, you know, okay. Shreveport, like right there, you know, all that down there, the Tyler, Marshall, all that down through there. Um, it was weird. I mean, so every time we'd go six, seven days without anything to eat, you know, uh, one point we lived in a condemned home that one of my great uh, uncles came to us. Is this going on in and out? What sure What's that? Going in and out. No, you know what's going in and out. Oh no, you're fine. Also, sometimes this gets cloudy. That's just the way they ration the 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 memory. But it, it'll be 1080 in the recording. Oh, right on. Yeah. And so, uh, having said all that, uh, you know, uh, my grandmother uh, has really pretty much always been my mother. Uh, you know, we in the, that part of the South, black people, we call our grandmother Big Mama, not because she's fat or anything. It's because yeah. she's the she's quote unquote the Big Mama. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah big of Mama. Then you have your Mama. You know, mm -hmm. and then above that, you have Medea, which, like, you hear the Tyler Perry. But, <laughs> but, but, but a lot of people don't, didn't know that Medea because that's, like, your great-grandmother. But I was very lucky to meet all of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, when it talked, my brothers and I, you know, we were, you, it either breaks you or it makes you strong. And it made us strong. And now, of course, we were getting to be that age that if something changed, uh, we'd probably wind up in jail or dead or there wasn't so much really gangs back then as it was, you know, you had a posse of cats you ran with, but uh, my grandmother always had me in church. And, and finally, when my mother got finally got so sick where she couldn't, because my grandmother always wanted my mother to move back. Um, 
But I think my mother was very young. I think my mother died. She was 31 when she passed away. Oh, my God. That's 31 for oh. colon cancer. And, Sorry. Uh, oh. You know, it, it, it was, uh, it was wow. one of the things that she was very defiant almost to the end. I mean, it wasn't until she got to the point where she couldn't fight back. And my grandmother closed her house up and, and moved up to Dallas to take care of us, which was great for us kids because we were eating every day. We were being taken care of. And, and we were loving it, you know. Of and uh, finally, when my mother got... Uh, what we used to call in the country low sick. You know, when you get to the point where you're about to pass on, and my grandmother moved all of us back to Tyler, who my mother to take care of her those last, uh, the last month or so of her life. And, uh, and and then once my mother passed, you know, we were just kind of wondering, you know, it was weird. What, you know, what was going to happen to us? I know that the aunts wanted to, our our aunts wanted to split us up because it was very weird that each aunt had. Uh, favorite nephew, which it works out that way, and uh, and I was always going to stay with my grandmother, and one aunt was going to take this brother, and one aunt was going to take the baby brother, and but my grandmother, being those old souls and old school, she was like, no, no, y'all not going to split them chilling up, and my grandmother took all three of us in and uh, uh, raised us from that point on. But again, when I say raised, you have to realize as far back as my mind can remember. I had always been large swaths of my life, like years at a time, uh, with my grandmother. It's right. kind of funny when I see that movie. If you ever seen that movie, The Help, you know my grandmother actually was one of those people. I used to, you know, I used to walk with my grandmother from our house to my great grandmother's house. My great grandmother would babysit me, and my grandmother would leave me there and walk to her job. And then in the afternoon, she'd walk back from the job to that house, pick me up, and then we walk to her house. I can remember that wow. day, plain as day. And so uh, it gave me some foundations, you know, about yeah. you know, how rough things can be and, you know, uh, uh, a certain outlook on life. My grandmother always uh, was one of those people that there are no excuses. So, <laughs> you know, she, <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't be like, I can't get a job because the man won't give me a job. I can't be like, mm -mm, mm -mm. you know, you can go out there and mow lawns. You can, you know, no, she, she didn't believe that. And, uh, so she's old school sister. So that's where I was raised, and it's, 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 it's the way I think and I approach things. And, and uh, my son, who just turned thirty, he always said, "Thanks for raising me the way you did, Dad." He's like, "I don't." He said, "Living in this world today, if I had been raised like these kids, I'd have the same problems." He said, "I don't have." To, he said, "They come to me for advice," and I'm like, "Well, you know, there's a reason that country folks did things the way they did. You know, it, yeah. it does. There is a value, and I say country. I shouldn't say country. Older folks." Uh, you know, we we the generation that like well, we don't want to whoop our children. We want to give our children everything and blah blah blah. And what it does, just like whether you believe oh, in the Bible or not, that it comes out you spoil the child, <laughs> spoil, spread the rod, spoil the child. So you have a lot of spoiled kids, black, white, Jewish, Latino, whatever color they are. They're spoiled. They don't they don't know how to work. They don't know how to greet people. They just it's just they don't know what common courtesy is, and a lot of them don't have quote unquote common sense. But as my yeah. grandma used to say, common sense isn't all that common. Isn't all that common? <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you a question. Uh, thank you for sharing that. It sounds like uh, your mom, your 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 grand, at least being with her, you had a lot of love and structure there, and that, and then you got that work ethic from her. Yeah. So it sounded like you benefited, Big time. like immensely from I, being around I, her. I would tell you honestly. And my, if my brothers were here on this pod, this this podcast or this video cast, they would tell you the same. Yeah. If it wasn't for my grandmother, I, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. What I mean by that, again, either I'd be in jail, I'd be dead, or I'd be out there hustling or something. Sure. Uh, sure. Because, you know, as a young man, you get to a point where you realize, like, I want the nice sneakers. I want to eat the day. I, you know, you, you're going to make, you, you know, you get to a certain age. You know, I was 10, 11 when my mother passed. So I was getting into those teenage, you know, I was getting to a point where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to be hungry today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hook, no matter hook, what. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. So uh, my grandmother, there was a great stabilizing influence on that as well as, uh, uh, you know, just thinking, you know, I think about it sometimes now. I talk to my wife and it's like, you know, he's, you're young. He's like, my grandmother, oh, my grandmother was only 50-something. She took in three nappy headed kids from the ghetto yeah. and brought them to the country. And let's say this. I have cousins who grew up with everything, brother, father, cars, all that. They've all been to jail or this, that, and the other. We three boys who grew up with nothing, and we've all accomplished quite a bit in our lives and raised our families and are married and married people. But that is all a direct result of Miss Aura Crawford. Big That's awesome.
Yeah. Yeah. I always say you're better off being too strict with your kids than too soft with your kids. Because if you're too strict, they're going to learn something. If you're too soft, they're going to learn nothing. Just like what your son was saying. Well, you know, Craig, the problem is a lot of people want to be friends with their kids. Yeah, that's out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. you're a parent. Yeah, I'm the same. I agree with you. You're, you're a parent. I mean, that don't mean you rule through fear. Right. Your your job is to teach your children. And so in order to do that, you have to be a parent. Yeah. You can't be a friend because... Uh, most kids, and if you want, if you have one of those kids that you can quote unquote just be a friend with, great, good, good on you. Mm-hmm. But uh, as a whole, the majority, you have to treat children as they are. They're your children. Your job is to be a parent, and your job is to make sure that they eat, make sure they're morally straight, make sure they understand and have uh, the best that you can give them as they grow up, so they have no excuses for not learning or not achieving or not accomplishing and showing them how to do that. That is your job as a parent. I your agree job is you now have a, you decide to have a child. Your job is to raise that child into a respectable human being. Yeah. You can't wait until they're 18 to start trying to do it. You got to do it from the day they was born. Mm-hmm. That means that you have to be a parent. You can't just always be a friend. That means that you're going to have to tell them no and sometimes yes, and you're going to have to force them to do things that they don't normally always want to do. Right. That builds character and it builds knowledge and it t- teaches them how to navigate so uh, social situations that are very complex instead of just throwing them in there and all of a sudden they're like, what we do, and then they make a mistake, and now everybody wants to jump on them. You let them make those mistakes in the in, in the formative year. That's that's yeah. the part of being a parent. You know, it, I it, it, as my grandma used to say, she didn't like punishing us, and she didn't like doing this, but uh, she's like, I love you enough that I'm going to do this so that you know the, the consequences of right and wrong. And, and I always tell people that we loved our grandma, and my grandma was old school. It wasn't a whole bunch of hugging. She never said the words until right before she passed. She never said the words, I love you. They didn't do that back then. You got to remember, I, I'm a, I, born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s. I'm a kid where everybody was mamas were hugging and kissing. My mama was dead. Right. I, I grew up with a woman from the generation before that, the yeah. tough generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you knew weren't. she loved you because she fed you, she clothed you, blah, 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 blah. It, the, it, it, but they didn't go around doing all the extra hugging. They didn't go around just giving the word out like I love you and you know right. but you knew you were loved. Did that make any sense? It was yeah, tough totally. love, but love. When your so, son said to you, I was curious, your son said, Dad, I'm glad you raised me that way. What age did he start saying that? Because my kids say it, but they hated the way I raised them when they were little and they started he, around twenty five, twenty six telling me. He that. just turned thirty in September and uh he had a situation where he you know uh, full ride scholarship and all this stuff to play play sports, you know, three point eight uh, GPA, and he had all that, some Division two schools, a couple of Division one schools, but he had this great Division three school that is a Ivy League school that is the sister school to Brown University Holy. out in uh, Oregon. It's called Lewis and Clark. They wanted to oh. give him a full ride. It's back then. This is a seventy thousand dollar a year, uh, <laughs> you know, the tuition seventy G's a year. That was back then. <clears throat> and they're giving him a full ride. I mean, full ride, not a partial. I mean, full ride. And I'm like, your job is to play, go to school, play basketball. You're being paid right now to play basketball. And and, and I said, the good part is they pay you to play basketball, and you get to get this unbelievable education. I said, believe me, it does better where you get your degree from. Yeah. I said, a guy from getting a degree from here, Brown, Yale, Princeton, blah blah. It's probably going to get the job over a guy getting it from Arizona State or, or you see, you know. It, it, Abs- it, it, state that, school, yeah. It, yes. it, where you get your degree from doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, and, and let me say before anybody gets mad, that don't mean that you're not even smarter than those other guys. Correct. Well, you may be, but it's the institution's reputation itself and what that means. Yeah. So, I, you know, he went to the school and, and he did really well at first. But, you know, it was the first, his mother was really, really tight. Because we separated, even though I was always there, he never got a chance to be a boy. So, uh, uh, a young man, I should say. So, in some ways, because his mother just was like, you know. So, now all of a sudden, he's he's 20 hours away at a school in Oregon. He's six foot eight, 225 oh, pounds at that time, you know. Uh, and he's the big man on campus. And <laughs> he's 18 years old. So, he had fun. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know. He had fun, uh, and you know, and and got into a little trouble and you know, academically and whatnot because he was having too much fun. But he didn't have at that time because of the situation she and I. He didn't have the 
mental cognizance of adulthood mm-hmm. or understanding that you know you know like son you know you're being paid to go to school you know you're being paid you know the basketball is the extracurricular thing but that's that's job yeah but, but get this education you know you know, said you know this you know you want to be a doctor and all this stuff and he had all the qualifications he just also have to be really good at basketball so he was a smart jock. That's why we didn't go to one of these Division One schools or Division Two school. We went to a sure. school that we knew he could uh, thrive in, but it meant something when he got a uh, degree from there because he wasn't going to get a, a degree in in uh, uh, radio or a degree. I mean, he was getting uh, underwater a basket weaving. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, he'd always been an honor roll student and happened to be a great athlete. You know, yeah. that's, that's what I was blessed with. And yeah, that's I a blessing. Got in trouble with me one time his entire life, twice, twice in his entire life. He was that kid. I got lucky. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it, there it means something when you you have to be a parent. What I mean by that is you got to let your kids explore a bit. You have to give them enough room to make mistakes. And and people like they don't want the kid to make mistakes. I'm like, no, everyone's making mistakes, including you. The thing with your children is you want them to make these mistakes right now when they're like from nine till about fifteen, sixteen. And people are like, well, what do you mean? I said, my grandma always said that that age right there is enough time for you to make a mistake, recover from it. Yes. Understand what the mistakes is, and usually it won't affect you down the road. Other than you have the knowledge and and the memory of how, how you got it, that, you know everything that entwined with that. She said you don't want to start making mistakes when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, because these are mistakes that are wind up sticking with you forever, yeah. or literally changing the course of your life. So part yes. of being a child is to get in trouble and make some mistakes, and and as a parent, you have to kind of guide that, and so they get that experience. And, uh, you know, a lot of kids don't get that. Now, my son had that. He made, he made his mistake. He he even dropped out of school. That's the one I wanted to kill him on, though. He, I remember him texting yeah, me on one. Father's Day that he was quitting, you know, that he left. On Father's Day. He Happy sent me Father's text. Day, Dad. He sent me a text. Yeah. You know, he was smart not to call me because he knew. Yeah. And even then, it took my wife uh, literally uh, duct taping me to the house to <laughs> I'm like my mom used to say, uh, boy, I kill you and make another one just like you. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, because of the way I raised him and, and he understood adversity, instead of giving up, he took like a year or two to get himself together and he put himself back to school. Uh, he paid for it, put himself okay. back to school. He's got a BA and, and, and an associate. He still wants to get his master's. Uh, he's working in a uh, great IT job that he just got. Uh, at one point, he was working three jobs and still going to school. So, you know, he realized later, because of all the teachers and understanding that game, instead of just rolling over like a lot of young men would have done and just uh, that was it and blah, 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 you know, he took a little time. He understood his mistake. He was young enough, as I took telling him, and talked to me about it, and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and got back on the, back, got back on the horse and did what he had to do. Right but some on. of that is the fact some of that happened because his mom, at the time when us being split, wouldn't give him the freedom that you have to give a young man. You know, because everybody's like, I don't want him to get in trouble. No, you don't want him to get in really bad trouble, but you need yeah. them to let them get in trouble because this keeps them from getting into really bad trouble. It's a learning experience. This is yeah. why you can't be your child's friend. You have to be their parent. And that so don't you, mean you're you not friendly put, with your child. You, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, but you got yeah. it. your responsibility is to be their parent, not their friend. Right. Not their friend. Yeah. And that's what so they that mean. Means sometimes they're going to hate you. Right. Oh, well. Yeah. Oh, they well. don't really hate you anyway. Right, right. <laughs> so, right on, man. I'm with you on that 100%. I get a little long winded. Sorry about that. No, brother, you're fine. So at a certain point in time, you leave Texas and you moved out to San Diego. Uh, what prompted that move and what kind of adjustments did you have to make moving from a small town in Texas to a big city in California? What, where, you know, what's weird is it, it really wasn't the city. What part of that is, uh, so I'm graduating from high school. I'm, uh, I'm 18 years old, almost 19. Uh, and I'm sitting there like I had no prospects. You know, I had no prospects. And the way I was raised, I was one of those being, I, I was never going to live on my grandmother. Once sure. I, I knew that once I got to a certain age as a young man that, you know, it was time to go get a job. You know, this is the way I was raised. You know, I, I would have been homeless because we wouldn't, you know, we had so much respect for our grandmother that there was no way. No way I was going to be a grown man sitting in her house, you know, or I go work three jobs so that she don't have that paper. It's something, you know what I mean? That's just the yeah. way and respect we have for our grandmother. But, uh, so having said that, at about 17 years old, before before I graduated, I knew I had no prospects, so I signed up for the delayed entry program uh, for the Marine Corps because I always wanted oh, okay. to see the world and everything. So I decided 
my only prospect at that time to get out of where I was and be able to go out on my own two feet without worrying about uh, food and this, that, and the other was for me to join the military. So the uh, Marine Corps was my, my uh, uh, weapon of choice, I should say. And so I joined the Marines, and that was led me out to California. And so I wound up staying in the Marine Corps altogether a, a total of like 10 years and uh, loved the Corps and traveled the world with the Corps. And it was one, it was very funny because uh, no matter where they sent me in the world, when it was over with, I always went back to Southern California. They always sent me back to Southern California. And That's never funny. was I stationed on the East Coast. I mean, I, I, in, I was in Japan for three years, uh, whether I was on the Westpac or whether I was out uh, doing MPS ship stuff, whatever. When it got done, they always sent me, every, if, if, not just on the West Coast, back to the same base. I always got sent back to Camp Pendleton. So right there in the Oceanside area, people that from this area know, know it. And so, uh, you know, I was there from the 80s up until, Jesus, man, <laughs> Literally up until two thousand and something, you know. And then I went to LA for a little while, and and I then finally moved out here where I am now in Arizona. So, but yeah, very cool. What um, what made you start performing? Because like I I rem you're I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you released your first record when you were forty one. That is was that the that age I was. Dude, I, I mean, I, I think so if I did my math right. Okay. But, dude, that is badass. Most people are like, you know, starting in their 40s, like, well, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I'm just going to resign myself to, you know, go to my job, you know, put my money in my 401k. And, like, they, there's a lot of joy sucked out of their life at that point. You're yeah. like, you know, fuck it, I'm releasing my record. My, I thought that my, was cool. My wife. My wife, dude. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, when I met her, when I met her, uh, I was working three jobs, and I used to be a bouncer. I used to have my own. Well, I was, I was a cooler. I had my own. I had three <laughs> different clubs, twelve employees that uh, we worked in those clubs as bouncers and whatnot. That's how I met my wife. I actually met my wife through my daughter, stepdaughter, and uh, it, 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 we were just friends and stuff like that. And, you know, like the way she looked. Come on, we're guys. You know. And women course. always get mad, like, why are you looking at me like that? Like, listen, I, I'm not a psychic. I don't know if you have a good heart. I don't know if you have a good brain. What I do know is you have an unbelievable figure. Look at the legs on that girl. And that's what guys see. And then later, if everything goes right, I get to know all this other stuff. Women act like they forget that. Look at my soul. I don't. I can't see your soul. I'm not a witch. What I can see uh, is those six-inch heels and the booty you got hanging out on there. And, 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 we're visuals, and that's what it means for me and the visual. But that's a whole other story. We yes. don't want to get into no trouble. But it, it, it is what it is. But you know women do that. Uh, wait, wait, didn't you? What, it, it, no. The only thing you look at my legs and my butt, I'm like, yes, I don't know you from Adam. I, I can, <laughs> this is what I see. I, you know, we're attracted to what we like when we see it. Absolutely, now, man. The question is whether you're going to be a girlfriend or wife in your material is after we get beyond that and we start talking to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But what brought me over to Angie Gordon is, what it is. Uh, the drink is, is, is the package. So, ladies, don't get mad. That is the way work, work, life works. I am not a psychic. I can't read your mind. I can't read your... I don't know you from Adam. I don't know your friends. I don't even know where you work. What I do know is you look good in that dress. I don't pay us tonight, and I'm a holler. Yeah. That, that's what <laughs> uh, that's my what wife, it's about. So, so one night... Uh, hold on a second. Billy, Hush! My dog, I think the pool guy. He, and you know what? He didn't start barking until we got on. So we start. So we hit the record button. It, <laughs> Come uh, uh, my bulldog won't say nothing, but my little my little black one, you know, wouldn't bust a grape in a food fight. But so um, so one night I'm bouncing, and uh, one of the bands, you know, this is a rock club. It's a pretty rough place. It used to be a biker bar, and then the the old guy passed it on to his daughter, and she turned into a dance club. So okay. we have bikers and cute dance girls, and then we're 10 miles down the street from the, the second largest Marine Corps base, Camp Pendleton. <laughs> so at, at one side, I would have bikers, Hells Angels guys over here, Marines over here, and then party people and party girls in between. You know, have naked biker babes. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, good place to be a bouncer for me. I was going to say, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a great place to be. Yeah. And uh, so one night this band is playing. And I don't know what the singer was doing. I think he was trying to impress a bunch of girls. And somehow or another, I'm standing there. I I, I, I I wind up with the mic. And it was like, you know, like he was saying, like, I, I, I don't know. And I hadn't sang probably, you know, I grew up singing in gospel, but I hadn't sang probably 15, 16 years. And some rock song. But that song. 
<laughs> yeah, Rock and Roll by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, don't know yeah. the song. Yeah. I don't know the song. Still don't know the song. But you know what? I'm from the church. A melody is a melody is a melody. I can always make something up. You know, so, and go so along you with got the, the mic, and that's what you did. Yeah. So I just he just kind of he was trying to embarrass me or something. I don't know. It, it was I came to this day I can't remember how he went to what what was what was the what was behind him giving me the microphone. You know the the head bouncer guy. But so I took the mic and just like all right, I had done it in a while. Let's have this fun. The band is playing, so I just lunch into something and had never heard the song. I'm just singing something, you know, just playing around and you know doing some vocal gymnastics and stuff and. And uh, and I, I kind of get a mic back to him, and I turn around, and uh, the whole audience is looking at me like, like what the hell, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, whatever, and I, I walk on. Well, at that time, Pam, who's my friend, not even my girlfriend or my wife, she had saw that, and so as we became closer, the time went on. She was she was like, you know, I'm, I was working three jobs at the time, literally working three jobs, and she was just like, you know you really should do this music thing. And this must have been, this is right after I got into it with the white supremacist guy. So that was 99. She, she was like, you really need to do music. Your, your entire soul lights up and, and you, you know, the people who respond to it, you need to do that. And I'm just like, and I remember telling like, nah, 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 you can't make any money doing music. You know, I got three jobs. She's like, you know, you, you've had two knee surgeries. You just ain't the other, you're doing these jobs, you know, cause I was country. My mind was like, as long as the body hold out, I'm gonna work. Yeah, that's just the way country is. I got, I got somebody to take care of. You know, I work, I long, dig ditches, uh, put roofs. You know, whatever I got to do. You know, as long as it ain't stealing and honest, you know, I'll do it. I'm, not, you know, that's that's country. That's old, old man. Whether you're black, white, or whatever, that's just old man. As long as I got a truck and my back is good, I can always make some money and do what I need to do. Right, and, um, right. But my wife just wouldn't put up. She was just like, you need. She wouldn't give up. And for for years she pushed. She like you need to do music, and I was always like can't make a living at it. And so she started. And you hadn't and you hadn't performed outside that performed one since, night. Uh, not one night since uh, I was probably seventeen. So wow. entire time, by the time I left, the entire time I was in the Marine Corps, and we probably been talking about for sixteen years, I didn't touch keys, drums, or a microphone. Wow! And didn't didn't miss it at all, and I was mentally burnt out too because I, I've been playing seven almost seven nights a week, gospel wise. I got yeah. up pretty high in the gospel world, you know. I made it up to the state and the national level, worked with some of the big names and all that. Didn't realize it back then, but uh, you know that's where it, the youth is. That's pretty good, and so no, I hadn't touched it and hadn't, hadn't thought about it. But she wouldn't give up, and so she started taking me to jams and stuff, and uh, or booking me on jams. I didn't even know about these, and you know the weekend. Literally, <laughs> my wife is the bomb. Literally, we'd be going out for a weekend, and, and I'm always like, I don't care where we go. As long as you have it, you just tell me where you want to go, we'll go. And we would show up at these places, and I'd be like, what the hell is this place, you know? And and uh, we sit down and watching the bands play, and next thing I know, my name would get called. And I'd be like, what the hell? You know, because she didn't already sign me up. She didn't scouted it out. You know, <laughs> you know, she's done all this stuff, you know, and make, to make me get up the scene, to try to make me get into the, you know, Music business, and I still didn't want to do it. And uh, finally, I think it took a few years, and and uh, I started listening to a lot of Sun House and and BB King, and I hadn't really listened to blues very much. Like I said, I was a gospel and soul guy, and so I wound up starting my first soul band, the Urban Gypsies, and we became a pretty good sized name, a corporate band in the San Diego area where people really knew who we were. And then from there, I realized, you know, and all those guys were big name, semi semi big name guys that had been around and they had, they had played the games and understood. So they didn't want to write, they didn't want to tour, they just wanted to be able to play, you know, have their local bands so they can go sure. and play it. But I wanted by this time now I'm in a band. I'm like I wanted more than that. And then I realized that you know one of the guys, uh, James East, the brother of Nathan East, was in right. the band as, as our bass player, and some other really big name cats. But then. Uh, I met uh, one of the guys was Jim Marino, and Jim Marino would, would come in and play kumbas and stuff. Was he was the original member of the Ink Spots? And, oh my uh, God, that's had, way he back. Set, he had set me down one night. And he was like, "Man, you know, you you could do this." And I'm like, "What do you, he, me and Pam?" I remember that conversation. He's like, you could do this. I'm like, "What do you mean?" It's like, you know, the, this band is great, but these guys don't want to write. They don't want to do this. You need to, you you're like you one of those guys that you could make it in this business. And and I and I always remember that. I don't, don't say about that very often, but that was pretty cool. Make a long story short, 
So uh, that inspired you. So he put a little bit of a spark in your head. A little bit. But most of it was for my wife, Pam. Yeah. So and after that, all this other stuff happened. And then next thing you know, she, I went to some jam in this little city of Temecula, California, which it used to be a little city back then. There's this big giant. And that's where I met uh, Dwayne Hathorn from Aunt Kizzy's Boys. And they already had a singer and all this. They were like an eight-piece band. And, and the next week I came back, Dwayne had brought in Jimmy King, the guitarist of the band, and and literally, uh, probably eight days after that, I was playing at the, uh, uh, the not you know what's it called? It's the Julian Jazz Fest, but some big jazz fest, jazz festival. And I remember thinking like, it was like all these black people there, and, and I was nervous as heck. And I remember <laughs> my wife asked me like, "Why are you nervous?" I said, "Because black people are different from white people." She's like, "Well, what do you mean?" It's like, well, black people will come up and tell you how good or how, how, how bad you are to your face. White people will be more diplomatic about it. Black people just go slow, like, "Look at baby, not everybody's been this thing in the choir." So be the usher. They just come tell you. You know, they just, you know, that's why by the time you come out of the church, most of these guys are professional. Don't you? You've gone through the gut. You know, by the time you get to the circular world, it's like, oh, you know, this is easy, you know. Easy. Yeah, but, yeah. But it's been 18, 19 years since I've started in front of black people or done anything serious, and I'm just sitting there with this man. And anyway, and that, that kind of re sparked the spark. And from there, you know, and Kisses Boys, I think we did a total of uh, two albums, actually three. One was never released, and we wound up taking second place in the International Blues Challenge down in Memphis. And, in Memphis, yeah. And uh, we wind up winning the. Um, uh, a distribution contract in L.A. going up against a bunch of soul and funk bands at the, uh, the what was it called, the uh, the Lamb Jam, the Los Angeles Los Angeles Music Network. And so there were people there from Arista and Epic, and they were the judges and all this, and, and they awarded us with that. A, a freaking blues band, older cats, came in and beat out these young R&B cats and all that, and that was pretty good, got a distribution deal. And, and from there, things, you know, things just started... Uh, uh, Blowing up, but then it got to a point where even with my band and Kizzy's boys, they didn't want to tour, and they toured a little bit. But it's one of those weird. As a musician, you know, it's time you've outgrown something. Sure, that makes sure. any sense. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and at the same time, we wind up getting rid of the avocado ranch, and my wife closing our private practice and took a position in Cedar Sinai and Beverly Hills. And around that time. We moved to Los Angeles, and so it was like starting all over again. Because I'm in LA now, and as you know, it's a different beast. And yeah. no one, no one in LA knows me from Adam except for the guy that produced our albums, Chuck Boris. He's on a studio called Slideway Studios, and they used to call Chuck the Slide God. And uh, yeah, again, it goes back to my wife. Now I'm sitting in LA now, and I'm sitting around every day. I'm bored out of my mind. Uh, about to start. You know, I'm at that point where I'm about to fall back in there. We have it's like, let me go just go get me a, a nice day job and, you know, screw all this and take care of, you know, because I just can't live off a woman. And, and there's nothing, nothing uh, male chauvinistic about it. Just, I was just ready. You just want to contribute. And contribute. Yeah, and that, that's, yeah, I you know, that. And uh, my wife, I think, who's always in touch with everything, she realized that. And so she, she wound up finding this jam in L.A. And, uh, uh, Man, what? That, she's like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would, it, it wouldn't be in music at all yeah. if it's not for yeah. There's no Yeah, one. that's all. And, that's uh, really she nice. She made me go. She made me go. And, and and I went like three times, and no one would call me up to the jam. You know, you, you're the new guy. I, no one knows you from Adam. You know how it goes. Of course. And it's yeah. a pro jam, supposedly, and one of the top L.A. cats. And finally, it was one of the nights, is, you know how jams go? Uh, it was one of the nights it wasn't that busy. And my name was on the list. I'm sitting right there. But, I, you know, I got enough coy that I don't push it. I just put my name on the list, and I'm going to sit back. And when I get a chance, if they call my name, I'll go up and do my little thing. And so finally that night, they called me up. So I went up and did my thing. You know, it was supposed to be one song. I think they let me do five. And, and I'm like, All right, I'm done. I walk off the stage, and I come back uh, the next week, and they they knew who I was. They called me right up. I didn't get a chance to sign. I'm like, oh, okay, this is, okay, this is not some cats. And three weeks later, three weeks after that, I get a call from the owner, and he was saying at the time it was run by this name a guy named John Marks, which is like a big name in LA for a long time. He's like a blues historian. Uh, the place was called Cozy's, and so the owner was like, "Man, we really like what you're doing." Steve Ricozy. Steve Ricozy. Dude, you know yeah. this is a small world. I it's know him because world. I know he's living on the East Coast. In he lives in Florida. 
Yeah. And I knew him. I didn't know him. He he like I guess he listens to my show, and then he I, somehow through that I became sort of like social media friends with him. And he told yeah. me he owned Cozies. He owned Cozies. Wow. And, and Cozies Cozies was the uh, what are the big the whiskey a go go slash the Roxy for the blues, a blues right? Yeah, and blues rock soul side. Well, why not? Well. I don't know how much time we got, but uh, but to make a long story short, what winds up happening is I wind up running Cozy's. I bring in Aunt Kizzy's boys, and they're okay, but Chuck is like, no, nah, you know, they're not good enough for Los Angeles. He's like, I, I'll let you run the jam, and I'll bring the band in every week uh, behind you to, uh, to back you up. And I'm like, well, man, I don't want to be stuck out here with no band. He said, no, I got it, man. He said, I'm going to bring in a bunch of industry cats, the big name cats, every week. And I'm just like, okay, because I don't know anybody in L.A., and so every week, as I learned, started learning about who people were, every, every week there was these these Rock and Roll Hall of Fame legendary cast, you know, from Slash to Jim Carrey. That's how I met Al Cooper, to Mike Finnegan, to to uh, to Sun House, not Sun House, to uh, Honey Boy Edwards, to, uh, the, the, you know, uh, she, just name it. My, and so out of that, all of a sudden, the big rock guys and some of the big R&B guys, we started having the movie stars showing up. And, you know, the Pussycat Dolls used to come whenever they were in town. I could never get them up to sing, but they would be there. And Bobby Brown and uh, uh, Bag of Band, all these guys. And, and uh, uh, I became friends with the guys from Lifehouse because they would come in every Monday night. I don't know if you know that band, Lifehouse. I knew those guys. And, you know, yeah. uh, some of the guys from Prince, some of the guys from Steve Wonder's band and all this stuff. As a matter of fact, my first commercial I ever did, and I'm trying to remember the name of the commercial, but it was the Steve Wonder Band. It was the band without Stevie. So Nate and all those guys, they brought me in to sing on this on this commercial. I wound up doing like a couple commercials with them. Wow. Uh, that, that was my first thing getting the commercials. So make a long story short, all of a sudden I, I become part of the in crowd of the hip guys. You know, you know, uh, the, the Vivian Campbell, Luca uh Gary Malarber, Hank Van Sickle, uh sh- <laughs> so, so these are big marquee names. Yeah, but they would come in every Monday night and play for free. Yeah, right. The right. place would be just, just, just packed, and I didn't know anybody. You know, I think I had met Slash once before in New Orleans some years before, but he looked totally different by this time now. So, but Chuck knew everybody, so you know, so I wound up getting a lot of commercials and stuff out of that, and people got to know who I was and stuff like that. And, but I kept my own band going too, and uh, that's where it all kind of jumped out from there, and then. To make a long story short, and this is all because of my wife, but she had gotten a call from these guys that wanted me to front this band, and they were just trying out and make it look fun. I said, okay, well, you know, I got nothing to do. I'm just running the jam on Mondays, and I wound up being part of this band called the Invitation All-Stars. And we were doing what you call small, uh, I call them cocktail venues. Sure. You know, martini bars type things. But the money was incredible, and there would be all these huge movie stars and stuff in the audience. And I, and I was like, what the hell is going on? Because I know they don't know me. Well, finally, Pam and I, after like three or four shows, we like, okay, we got to figure out what's going on. And so we started, at that time when Google, we did the Wikipedia of the guys that were in the band. That's what, I was like, something got to be. So come to find out, you know, there's this guy named, God, I can't even remember his, his name now. Jesus Christ, it was just on my head. Adam Stark. Adam Stark, who wind up later wind up being one of the vice presidents of Pixar, was the guitar player. But on the on the bass was this guy named Gerald Johnson. I don't Jerry, know if you know Gerald? Je- no. A black guy, upside down, left-handed bass. He's actually the bass for Steve Miller, the original bassist from uh, Space Cowboy. They call no, me I, the Space yeah, Cowboy. I, I know the and music. All yeah. that stuff. All those. All those. All those uh, albums. The first four albums from now. It's Gerald Johnson. That was and great then music. On the, drum, on the drums is this guy named James Gatson. Oh my God! So we pick up his Wikipedia page and it just that's and so like that's, the that's OG. My, that was my first. That's my first band. Wow! The Invitation also was in L.A. You know, so you, you, you did Gassman pretty good. I, uh, I was lucky to forget. Didn't know who they were, but I always try to treat everybody with respect. I mean, Mr. Gas and I are really good friends. There, he calls me Sugar Booger. It's Sugar <laughs> Booger, Sugar Booger. But uh, and that's where everything kind of jumped off from. That's amazing, man. That yeah. is what a good story. I love when I like when he said you can do this. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I and, mean my wife had been saying it, but you know, sometimes when your wife said, 
you know, just like maybe she's yeah. just being nice because she she like the way it made me feel. But I'm like, you know. <laughs> no, what I think feels. is really cool is that she saw you perform one time, and you weren't okay. even performing. You no. got like, here's the mic, and what you must have had so much joy coming out of you that she, she grooved on that, and she said, "That's what you're meant to do." And that is literally, yeah. those are literally her words, brother. Yeah. It, that's it, so it cool. Me out. What a good story, man. Yeah. That's, I'm really happy to hear that. No, no, that's funny. I mean, those were literally her words. She's like, yeah, you're well, so lit up. You know, yeah. She's like, you, 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 you put on this record to do this. And I'm like, well, I like doing it, but you can't make a living doing it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So now let's get back to the question that started this. At 41... Sorry. No, no, it's all good. It was great. You self-released your first album, Blind Alley. What? Yeah. So then, what prompted you to now commit to a solo career? And like, this was back in the day a little bit. Everybody wasn't just in, releasing independent records. Right. What? How did that whole thing come about? And what did you learn from doing that? Well, we knew at the at this time. You know, I had been you know, I had been touring quite a bit. I had been touring quite a bit, actually, uh, with the with the band uh, Kisses Boys in San Diego. You know, we were playing somewhere between six to eight shows a week. Oh, okay. We were doing those casino Back shows. Back when you had all these venues where you could do that, make a good living, right. too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we were doing those casino shows. You know, they pay us six, seven grand for a week, which we thought was good money. Yeah. But you'd come in and play, you know, like $1,000 a day or 1200 bucks a day. You'd come in and play for three, four hours every day just at a certain time. So you knew you had a week worth of gigs. Yeah. And at that time in the San Diego area, they had all these uh, Native American casinos popping up left and right. So we had like 10, 11 of them. We used to play them all. It was like, the, we called it the Casino Chitlin Circuit, you know. <laughs> and then and then That's what we called it. The and casino then, uh, chitlin circuit. Because, like, the top five bands were doing it. And so then uh, every once in a while you fall off to a club. But, you know, the money was good, but you realized you, you weren't going to work career-wise. And then yeah. uh, L.A., once I got to L.A., uh, it, it, it just it, it got to a point where, you know, I was doing so many co so much commercial work, and I didn't know the ins and outs at that time. You know, I didn't, people, it, a lot of the stuff I did was just buyouts. So, like, the not, not so much uh, uh, the McDonald's commercials and the, the, you know, True Blood had a couple songs and a couple of different episodes of that, a couple of different episodes of Person of Interest, uh, the, the thing stuff like, say, Judge O'Brown, and, and and I've done many commercials uh, since then. So they just gave you a sync fee, there was no royalties. Right, no royalties, just just a buyout. You know? Yeah. But I didn't know. Yeah. And, and I was just happy that these people would, you know, and people would hear my voice. Yeah. And it was just weird how things changed. Cause Chuck Devoris, the guy that brought in the guy from jam kind of helped me too and uh you know we wind up doing uh the bohemian club and that you know that's where i met uh oh god Lord, i'm so bad sometimes with names my mind goes blank because i've been there be that age but he's be he's <laughs> been the, the music director for john denver and he was also doing all these plays and stuff and so what a lot of people don't know is that i wind up being the lead of the original ain't nothing but the blues with the original Four times Tony nominated original cast, and I wind up playing uh, Ron's uh, Ron premise Ron Ron Thomas part. Uh, just sold out shows off Broadway and blah blah blah, and that was cool. And you know how all that stuff. I mean, when you stop and dig, I, I've done so much that, that that you know it's like sometimes I'm just like Jesus Christ, my brain is in the. So one night. I'm I'm sitting at this place in Tarzana, California, and I get well. Actually, I'm sitting there at my little place in L.A. I get a call from my buddy uh, Cal David. Cal David used to be with the Fabulous Rhinestones, and uh, he used to sit in uh, as the pseudo lead guitarist and vocalist for Chicago and those guys back in the day. They were all friends, and so him and Jimmy Vivino called me up. I had Jimmy on my show a long time ago. Yeah, yeah Jimmy's good people, crazy. Yeah. I, 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 I give him a hard time about his beard now, but it's just because he'll keep growing. Man, won't anyway. <laughs> uh, but he good people and a uh, uh, hell of a cat. So I get a call from Cal and Jimmy that they're playing at uh, this place called uh, the Maui Sugar Mill, and I mean you might be able to get 120 people in this little place, you know. They have a lot of music there though, don't they? Because I've heard oh, yeah. a lot of good yeah, guys my buddy, playing. My buddy there. Cadillac Zach. See when I when I let. When I when when Steve Ricotta moved to Florida, but we were still running Cozies, mm -hmm. me and Big Mo and all those guys. So 
it, when it got to a point where I got so busy that I couldn't do the jam anymore and decided to shut the jam down, all those cats that loved what was going on started going to the Sugar Mill. Where, okay. Uh, kind of like Zach. So he got my old crowd. Yeah, because it's a lot of work, and I was touring on top of that. So it just got to a point where it just wasn't feasible for me to do it anymore. But thanks to, to all the cats that ever came through and played from El, from the DeBarges to the Dramatics to all the rock cats that came through. I mean, you you know, there's some videos that people took, but, you know, it wasn't as big back then. But, I mean, you name it, Monday night you walk in there, and people that you know them back then played 150 200 bucks a seat. They were just up there playing with an all-star wow. You know, I had the full tower power horn, part of the tower power part, earth, wind, and fire, and a Phoenix horn one night. Now, it, there's a picture that there's literally 12 horns on this on the stage that only holds eight people. It's just weird. Uh, Epic used to bring in Orianti. So Orianti used to come in and sit in. There's a video with me, Orianti. So it's me, Orianti, slash Mike Finnegan, Gary, no, Alvino Bennett from the Dave Mason Band, who's also originally in my band. And uh, I forgot who was playing bass. It might have been. My old MD, Ralph Carter, from the Dave Money Band. He wrote all the Dave um, uh, money, uh, money stuff. I, I probably said the name on Dave Money, but Ralph Carter. And, um, yeah, it was just, you know, it, it was this this moment in time where the blue soul oh, Ralph guy, Carter. Is that the guy who used to play with Jean Eddie Monty? Monty? Oh, Eddie yeah, Money. Okay. Eddie okay. Money. He, okay. he wrote yeah. Shaking and all that. He was the bass okay. player. If you go back and look at the videos, you can see Ralph playing the bass. Okay. Ralph is my my writing partner and my friend, and we became really good friends because he came in and played bass on one of the songs for Aunt Kizzy's Boys. That's how we kind of met years before. And then all of a sudden, the LA, they got to find out him and Chuck were friends, and Ralph come sits in and blah, blah, blah. And, and Ralph is like, you should start your own band. And, and that's, it, it, it's a lot of complicated and overlapping things that were happening. And, um, uh, uh, it, it so the, they they caught me up that night. I go in to sit in to, to sing. I, I think I was supposed to do one song. I wind up doing like four. We were just having a good time. I love those guys, and, and God bless uh, Miss Lori Bono from you know the Bonos, uh, you know Cher and all them. Lori Miss mm-hmm. Lori Bono is a good friend, and she was Cal's partner for forty years. Cal passed away uh, right toward the end of COVID. There with, with oh, some heart problems. Uh, God bless his soul. Love that cat. Uh, really gave me a chance and really helped me with people. And anyway, we playing that night. We're throwing down. And the band is sounding good. And, I mean, it's Cal David on guitar on one side, Jimmy Babino on guitar on the other side. I think it was James Gatson on the drums and he watched somebody playing bass. And, and then some little, some little, I thought he was British, British guy playing the harmonica. So we, we throwing down. This little place is packed. That's lined out the door. So as we get done, we stand outside. And I'm standing next to Cal, Cal David, and, we, and I hadn't seen him for a while. We're just talking, and and then this little British guy or this little Australian guy, whatever he was, wants up to me. He's like, mate, you know, I see them all, mate, and, you know, you're one of the best, mate, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, you know, you know, you know how it goes with the kids. He's like, all right, man, thank you, brother, man. I appreciate you. I just want to play with you, you know. It's cordial. It's like, you don't take it serious or whatever. So the guy walks away, and Cal is laughing. Because I don't just play with this cat. Cal's laughing. And I'm like, Cat, what's, what's so funny? He's like, man, you don't even know who that is, do you? I'm like, uh, no. I said, he's a pretty good harmonica player. He said, that's John Mayo. I'm like, well, I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know John Mayo's name. Oh my god! I that mean, was... I knew his name. I didn't know his face. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I didn't because I'm not a rock guy. You know. And so wow. I go through all that to say, Randy Sharkoff is in the audience, and unbeknownst to me, he's in the audience. Uh, 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 the the other lead singer for the Managed Boys had just left the band and decided to take a, a big gig in Las Vegas. And next thing I know, two days later, I get a call from Randy Sharkoff who asked me uh, if I would come in. Because the Managed Boys at that time was kind of like a big review. It was the top West Coast blues cats. That yeah, they were going to do like this, this huge some, review. Yeah, And uh, I didn't know who they were. But he like, man, you know, I pay you X, Y, and Z. You know, uh, I'm like, okay. And I kept thinking that it was going to be a rehearsal. There was no rehearsal. Next thing I knew, I got out of that tickets. I'm flying to freaking Honda Radio of Spain I'm trying to learn the songs. <laughs> I'm literally learning the songs uh, on the plane, and I have no idea. You know, I land. I land, and they put me up in a nice hotel and stuff, and my wife came with me, and we were just like, man, this is nice. This is, you know, in the back of my head, like, what the hell am I doing here? What's going on? So I walk out with the band, and we wind up doing, like, one of them, you know, in-room rehearsals. You know how bands that play all day, you know. We're in, in somebody's hotel room. You know, drummers on the pillow and the sure. guitar players playing. You know, 
And I'm like, okay. And we walk Who out. Who was the guitar player at the time? Was it Kid Ramos? At that particular time, it wasn't even, it wasn't even the whole manage board. That's another thing. Because <laughs> Randy was in the world about that. But it was Kid Ramos on one guitar. And God bless his soul, my good friend who just passed away, Willie J. Campbell on the bass. Okay. And and then a guy named Sean Pittman on the other guitar. And then the J.R. And J. I forget who his father is. J.R. He was playing uh, drums. Uh, J.R. Uh, Robinson. And, yeah, no, I can't remember. It, it, it's, they're part, they they hang out with those guys from Los Lobos and all those guys. Anyway, they're, they're like whole crew from that era. They what Los Lobos or Los Lobos, somebody. And anyway, that was the band. And okay. so I walk out on stage. Literally, I have no idea. I go. They bring me from my hotel room. They put me in the car. They drive me to the side of the stage. The stage is like a football field. <laughs> it, it is huge. I walk out. I just met these guys, the, the, you know, the night before in the hotel room. I haven't seen them since then. They didn't, didn't know them. Walk on on the stage. There's ninety thousand people. There's video of it. There's ninety thousand people. So this is a a, 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 a re, um what do you call it? it was a festival. This is a huge festival. It's the Hunderibia a jazz and blues. Holy festival. smokes! And it's like one of the biggest ones in the uh, Spain Spain France area. So your first gig with the Banish Boys was in front of 90,000 people. With no rehearsal, no, <laughs> you know. But, you know, it's old school, you know. I just walked out there and, and did what I do and kind of took over a little bit. And uh, it was it was a hit. I was opening for Finest, tasked me at the time, and it was a hit. And afterwards, on the play, uh, plane ride back is when uh, uh, Randy asked me to become part of the Banish Boys. Wow. So it worked. Yes, yeah, so all that. I'm not sure if I even answered your question. Like I said, I get a little long winded. No, but how did so how did you decide to go out on your own though? Would it release Blind Alley? But that's where we started at. Well, Ralph was just saying Ralph Carter, who was my MD and writing partner, Ralph wrote, uh we it's again quick trying to make a quick long story. We wrote Blind Alley, and that was the first time I had ever sat down and, uh, and really written anything out like that. Uh, it took me six months to write that song with Ralph, because you know I couldn't get what I had in my head out on the paper. And so Ralph was like, "Man, you know what you need is you need an album. You know, an album is like he said it's expensive, but it's like a good business card. It's, it's a, a business you, card, yeah. You know, you've done the Managed Boy stuff, and I believe me, a lot of people don't realize, don't know that we did Double Dynamite, the album with the Managed Boys, and we won Best Traditional Blues album that year. So I have a, uh, you know, I've won like I've been nominated for a total of 19, 21 blues music awards. I've won four. Uh, that's awesome. I was nominated for the Juno Award and the Maple Leaf Award. So, In Canada. Uh, yeah. yeah. The Maple Leaf Award, I was really happy about that one that year, but I was up against, it was Buddy Guy, Ben LeVette, Mavis Staples, and me. Yeah, that's a tough <laughs> crowd, I, man. But no one even, not that I would have a chance today, but no one even knew who I was back then. When yeah, I that's a tough crowd. So, yeah, so what else did I do? It's to be honored to be nominated it, with, that, it, with that crowd. Beyond honor. Yeah. yeah. Beyond honor. Yeah. Uh, but Nate was, uh, Nate, uh, Ralph, Ralph. Like, we need to do this. So we started writing, we started writing. And I talked to Pam, and Pam was like, yeah. So they, the only way for you to move up in this business is, is you need an album. You need a, a statement piece in which I always tell people albums today for us, uh, artists are, uh, it's with you to get out what you want to say. But for the most part, it's an expensive business card, very expensive yeah. business card. Uh, you got to have them. Uh, the way around it. But, but that's what it is. And so, we started recording Blind Alley, but what, what what ended up happening though is all these great rock guys and stuff that I known from the jam. They found out I was recording the album. They all wanted to be on the album. That's awesome. So there's you know Brian Head from Dick Dale and Foreigners on drums. Albino Bennett is on there. Teddy Andreas from uh, Guns and Roses and Carol King and all that is on there. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this whole merit. If you go through the names on the back of that album, there's this whole merit of, of, of uh, I guess you would call them uh, not not studio guys. Some of them were studio guys, but most of them were just uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But it's musicians. You know, they, they were all stage cats, cats that had played with everybody. You know, touring musicians, touring guys, and they yeah. all loved me. And so for basically a little bit of nothing, and sometimes for free, even I think is Gats on there. I think Gats is on there somewhere. Wow. Uh, they all just came in and played. And so this album wound up being 
it wound up being weird. Instead of the album that I thought was going to make, was going to put out all these original songs, it wound up in an album that was some originals and some covers because I had all these big rock guys that wanted to play on the album. And so it turned out to be the album Blind Alley. And, the, you know, and I put that out. I put it out. The reason why it got put out was because everyone kept telling me I needed a vehicle. If, if, if that makes any sense. They said, you need, you need a vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Tour behind and, and that would help launch your career. And I think that, you know, I'm I'm very happy with the way the Blind Alley turned out. And the way it did, I mean, considering that, I, I, you know, I had no label, I had nobody, and Pam and I were still kind of new to the business, and we spent our money and 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 got the praise and continue to get the praise that we got from Blind Al, but that like, is a, it's a testament that if you do, you know, if you do your due diligence, you can do it yourself too. Man, there's a song on there. I let love slip through my fingers. I love that track. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a really nice track. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, man. Appreciate that. Uh, now, the one so, I love the most is uh, was written by uh, uh, Arthur Adams. You know, you can't win for losing. You yeah, that's right. That's the next win. track. I haven't seen that in real, but it comes to my, my. You know, I got that weird brain that once I read, sing a song. Once I read a song, sing it. Once I read, once I sing it, read it. It's in my head forever. Does make any sense? Yeah, it does. That I can I can sing them forever. But the problem is, if I sing it wrong. Or read it wrong. It's stuck that way in my brain. I can't change it no matter what. So it's very weird. But yeah, that's how that. That's how that. That, that is the reason why and how Blind Alley came about, which is also how it led into Southside because the song, the album Southside, which I think there's a few years in between because I think I did some stuff with the Managed Boys in there. But the songs on Southside were the songs that were written for the go on Blind Alley. Okay, that was quite a bit later. Yeah, that yeah, was five years later. Yeah. We had written all these songs. We just never got a chance to put them on the album because Blind Alley wound up turning this thing without so many friends dropping by and wanting to play. Uh, 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 JT Thompson, all these—I mean, just all these phenomenal guys on that album that they wanted to play. So we we just let that album become what it was organically. Yeah. And then I was, you know, Pam and I was thinking like, well, I guess it can't hurt to have all these named guys on here. No, but, not know, at all. Well, plus, you're gonna have good music. It was, I think it was good music. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was good music. I, I mean, considering it was my very first album, yeah, I, man. You know, I think I think that it was okay. What, what? Okay, so once you decided, so you make that record, is it at that point you said, okay, now when did you decide I'm going to have a solo career? I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to leave the Manish Boys, or you know, what, however that worked out, or was it something it, that was kind of forced, just happened? No, it was really weird. You know, at some point I, I had an epiphany that all artists must have that I, that I was the best me that I, that I could be and and I kind of had that back when I was doing the Urban Gypsies but what what you know what wind up it's very strange the funny thing is at one point I was playing in five bands but I never let my the Sugar Ray band I never let it actually uh go like when I was with the managed boys Randy really wanted me to get rid of my band but I knew intuitively that doing that, that that means that all my eggs were in one basket and i was under someone else's control yeah you know also you know my wife being as smart as she was she was just always like no you know uh, no matter what you know keep your band because that keeps you from being manipulated because you could always go out and just uh decide that you know I'm, i need to do my own thing and so uh, that's sort of what what just kept my band percolating in the percolating in the background sort of mm -hmm. yeah and and uh and as a as a vocalist i knew that i needed to be able to push my own name in order to make a career where i wasn't always dependent on someone else so you know it's, it's totally different than being a guitarist guitarist or pianist or anything as a support actor it's, being a vocalist is weird uh, in the business and but I, so, you know, I just always kept my band working a little bit here and there. At that time, we were called Sugar Ray and the CK All Stars. But, you know, because Chuck Caporis had to get it, you know, and he was my MD at that time. You know, he had to get his, his yeah. two cents in there. So it was Sugar Ray and the CK All Stars. So, but we kept playing gigs and stuff, and uh, I never let it go. And, and what wound up happening is this girl named Morelli Roquet from France had this new booking agency called On the Road. And she had contacted Pam at some point, and before I knew it, I was touring Europe, uh, France, and then Europe and the rest of the world. 
And it got to a point where the Bandage Boys had to be on the back burner. It's just a side thing and because my own band was started picking up so much and touring so much, which is what I really wanted because I had the freedom to do me. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, it's a lot in there because playing with the Bandage Boys or playing with someone else at one point, let's see, how many? I think all together I, I have about 30 albums out there. There are albums that you don't even know about. So, oh, stuff <laughs> that, that really you've recorded, done session, did sessions on and stuff. Well, there's an album. Uh, what's the name of the album? I'm really bad with the name. Uh, but I had played it on my show, and it's me and the Phantom Blues Band uh, with this guy, Jazz Bolin. And it's a full album. It's, it's 16 songs, and I'm singing every one of those. It'll just be, uh, you know, uh, Larry Fulcher, Mike Finnegan, uh, uh, just the whole Phantom Blues Band, uh, Bunny Rachel Band, and, and that album. There's that, there's that whole album. There's one with me and uh, Duke Roblo and Jimmy Bond with the, the original Room Full of Blues guys. It's called Texas Road Blues. There's that album. There's uh, there, I mean, literally, there's another four, 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 five, four albums out there that yeah. I've never really promoted. That I'm, that I, and then we're not talking about the ones where I just go in and set in. There's, yeah. <laughs> you mean full yeah. albums where you, you yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the vocalist. So. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, 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 and then everything just kind of popped from there. It's, it's kind of hard now when I think back on it, like a giant spider web. But, you know, I think it all boils down to the way you treat people and the way you approach things, you know. I think that I got lucky with the the rock cats and the and the soul cats and the blues cats because I've always tried to treat everyone with respect in the same way I want to be treated. Well, I knew yeah. you are not, so I, I think that that it, I think that it meant a lot and it's helped a lot uh, for the business as well. Because people don't mind, they'll they, they'll support you, come back to you, and, and plus you just got a good rep in the industry. Well, that means everything, and I don't yeah. think that some people realize how much that means because, as you know, as a musician, there's a short list for every every position. And it's everybody knows everybody. Yeah. And, in this industry. and by the time your record company or anybody even finds out about some of these things, it's already done. By the time you find out about it, it the roster's already picked. Yeah. What you have to be is one of those people that is, or I think that's nice enough and and that's, uh, what's what I want to say? Not so much nice as it is the respected enough in the industry that cats that are in that room when that list is being put together, your name gets thrown out from one of those cats. Yeah. Right. That's that's the difference so, a lot of times uh, to make it or break it. I mean, the Internet's kind of changed that a little bit because uh, venues are booking people because they got 10 million followers. And I'm always like, that's fine, 10 million followers, but how many do they have that are even in driving distance or man, driving distance in your venue? But I know. Whatever. I don't even want to get started it, on it that. Doesn't make, it makes no yeah. sense to me, but whatever. And like, well, we need to see more eyes. I'll say, do you want more eyes or do you want more butts in the seats? But they're actually yeah. paying tickets, but. You know, the industry's got to find itself, and I think that, you know, the money will talk sooner or later, and it'll go back. It's already starting to go back the way it was. But having said that, that's that's been, that's kind of been what, is, what it was. That's, that's, that's it. Ray, I want to ask you about your last record, In Too Deep, because I know you're going to be touring it soon. I uh, just want to talk about a couple of the tracks on there. You got one called Invisible Soldier. Yeah. Um, Really cool funk track, man. It's got those like old school horn, horn arrangements. The, Eric Horn. The drumming on that track was awesome. Like Thank lots you. of funky syncopation. What's that song about? You know, it's one of those things that I have not talked about in Google Globs of albums. And Eric Horn is the first guy outside of my wife that I've been uh, uh, confident enough to talk about. And I've gotten to the age where it's like, you know, you don't give a, a shit. What think <laughs> <laughs> I know. You can't get know exactly what I was saying. It's it weird. Could be, it's because a, I'm not, I think we're pretty close in age, and it's like, yes, we are. You, you just don't care. I mean, it's you like. You just don't care. No, it's it's like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's not important yeah. what someone feels or thinks about. Not it. at all. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> and it's weird. not even it's any so of our, it's not even any of our business what someone thinks about what, uh, you know, however you feel, God bless you. That's up to God you. God bless you. Right yeah, on. man. Yeah. Keep on giving up. But having said that, you know, when I, uh, Eric Corn has been, has been one of the best, uh, I've been blessed. Uh, you know, he's the producer, he's the writer, he owns the record company, but he gets me. And, uh, you know, he called me up because, you know, asked me about, you know, writing songs and stuff. And he's like, you mind if we talk about your PTSD? And in the past, I would have shied away from it. But again, I'm at that age now. I was like, you know what, man? Yeah, let's talk. you know, I've been holding this crap inside for 30 years. Now, let's. Yeah, 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 let's talk about it. Let's talk. That's about awesome. It. I say, but you know what, Eric? The way I like to do things is, is I like to talk about serious things 
over funky music. And he's like, really? I said, yeah, because you know what happens is people get into the groove of the song and don't even realize what you're talking about sometimes three years later. And then it peeps in, you know, it slowly seeps in the head like osmosis. And he said, huh, what made you think of that? I said, because that's what Prince always did. Prince always did the nastiest songs in the world. Most people just got to listen to the music and they dig in the music. It's not until decades later they stop and start listening to the lyrics. It's like, I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Little Red Corvette to uh, uh, the Raspberry Beret to the Dust, all of them. You stop and listen to what he's actually singing. And you'll be like, I, I had no idea. I listened to this song for 30 years. Had yeah, no idea. Yeah. Anyway. So that's what happened with, with uh, Invisible Soldier. You know, uh, when I sat down and wrote it, these are things I had actually written in my diary from a long time ago, which is right here in my in my in my box right here. And I pulled it out and I started sending things to Eric and uh and he co wrote that and we just kinda like you know, just got uh real serious about the way I was feeling years ago. Not so much now, but 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 uh, years ago. And it, it's uh it's a uh, it's an ode to all those who have served and who suddenly come back and, and their families will not have to live uh through you know, th this mental stuff that's going through your head and anger and fear and, you know, I mean, I, my wife would tell you that I used to be so bad when I got out. I mean, I couldn't even sleep and I still don't sleep very well, but, I, you know, I'd be up walking the neighborhood like I'm walking a post, you know, yeah. checking the doors, you know. <laughs> I lived on a golf course, for God's sake. The, the old folks were <laughs> like, yeah, got this big Marine, big black guy here working security for free, you know, it's kind of like, but, you know, for me, mentally, it wasn't good. And, you know, yeah. I, my wife is such a calming person. Yeah. That because uh, I never really went and talked to anyone, but but my wife, you know, and it, and it took me years because you know I didn't want her looking at me in a different light, you know. But my wife is a medical professional and uh, and a, a, just a very calming type person, uh, just very earnest and forthright. And that over the years led me to open up with her, which literally helped me uh, mentally a lot. So at this age. I felt that, that you know it was time for Invisible Soldier because maybe it could help some of the young cat. Uh, you know these young cats now have it worse than I did because yeah. you know, they're doing two and three deployments. Uh, where when I was in, if you went to combat, you know you did your time, you made it through, you didn't go back. Uh, but you know, uh, now these guys are getting a, a month or two off and. Oh, and, and they're right 19 back. years old, man, 20 man, years like, old, yeah. and you can't process yeah. anything at that age. They think they can, but you can't. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and then in my day, when we, when, when we got out, I got out at the end of 92, uh, but I, that was the day I left. My son was born September 30th. I left November 15th. I mean, I still had time on the books, but as far as Marine Corps was done, I was out. I was honorably discharged. I was out. Of the was that Desert Storm you were in? Desert Storm. Yeah. I went to Desert Storm and Panama. So, oh, you wow. Know, after that stuff, you know, we, it, it was, uh, they didn't do what they do now. They, they didn't sit down with us individually and uh, talk to guys. You know, we were in there in some time in the company or not, so, I'm going to say brigade, brigade, but in company, company size rooms. And we'd all just be sitting there and they just parade for the next two or three to four hours, parade guys across the stage uh, to talk to us for a split second and leave. You know, now they're having in-depth interviews or in-depth conversations with uh, trained professionals one-on-one -on -one or in smaller groups when they get out. But my time, they didn't do that. At Vietnam time, those guys didn't even get what we got. You know, people don't realize they literally was in life and death combat 24 hours before. The 24 hours later, they're walking on the streets of their old hometown like nothing's happened. With no, no, no debrief, no... No counseling, no nothing. Literally, 24 hours ago, he was in Vietnam, liter literally fighting for his life, sometimes hand-to-hand. -hand. And at 9 o'clock at night, he was there. 9 o'clock a.m. the next night, he's sitting in his house in Chicago. Like, nothing ha happened. Like, was that a dream or, you know, so, you know, uh, America military has gotten better at uh, understanding PTSD uh, and the effects it has on, on military guys, but I still don't think, and probably most military guys will say that all their life, that, that, that it goes far enough. I mean, there is a point where there's only so much I guess they could do, but, uh, you know, there's still all those guys like like me that were from that, that, that era and guys that were before us uh, that no one really, really spoke to. Uh, and I'm 
one of the lucky ones to, to have my wife, but I know other guys that, that didn't fare so well or haven't fared so well uh, readjusted and, and so forth. And yet even even if you didn't go to combat, just the just the act of you know the the you can see Navy in there in the Air Force, uh, even the Army, but it's not like what training was in the Marine Corps. Even I mean, guy, even guys that just did four years or six years in the Corps, uh, you, you could. It's almost like being in prison. Almost you're conditioned to think a certain way. They take guys a while to be able to go back into quote unquote civilian life. It's not a, it's not an easy adjustment or easy transition for a lot of people. Uh oh, I lost it. Two, two, two. You still got me, though, right? I didn't touch you in the name. <laughs> there you, you go. There so you. Uh, I knew a guy, thank you, uh, here in Tam- in Tampa, and he was in uh, he was in the service and in Desert Storm as well. And uh, he saw he fought with the SEALs, and he was oh, saw, cool. and he was, you know, as he explained, he goes. I was just killing people 24-7. The problem is I got so addicted to that adrenaline. Yeah, people like and, to talk about that, too. Yeah. yeah, and he said, and then they send me home. I'm in Walmart the next day, and he said, I, 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 I wanted to blow my mind, you know, and so I really feel for guys like that because I had a long con- lot of conversations with this guy, and I don't know what the answer is because – it's a catch twenty two because really there needs to be some decompression time. But like once you're in there, you're like, if you're gonna go home, you want to go home. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. it's really tough. I feel so yeah. much, and thank you, man, for your service and what you did. We, we, we all serve, but we all again. I appreciate that uh, most, and I mean, I, I'm proud to be an American. But when you in, you realize that America. It'd be no disrespect. We love America, but the guy you fight for is the guy that next to you. It, yeah. it, you become a family. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and right. I mean, that's just that. that's just the reality of it. That's what, the, yes, guy what he, in, yeah. the guy that's in the fight hole with me. And then once I get home, all the, ooh, ooh the flag, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, let's, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. Uh, but but having, you know, having said that, I think, I was, like I said, I was lucky with my wife. And then even the bouncing job, it, it, it helped me get out a lot of anger. <laughs> that sounds weird, but. No, it doesn't. You know, that man. one time I would get you, into the, Thank Certain God you had no that. Blackouts. Yeah. Because yeah. You, if you're walking around with that and you're not getting it out, that right. serves nobody. No one. You know, it doesn't no serve one. yourself, your family. I mean, why? I mean, you know. Which is why a lot of those guys, you know, in rightfully so, you can't, you, you, you can't say anything derogatory to these guys. You know, this is why a lot of marriages fail because not everybody, first of all, you know who you're married to. And guys know... Or women know because there's women vets too, and my God, they, they go through it also. But um, you know whether or not your spouse or your significant other, excuse me, is a person that you can tell these things to that are not going to look at you in a certain way for the rest of your life. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. So of course. you know what? So what winds up happening is there's a high rate of divorce, and you you see shows and talks where people are like, oh, he wasn't himself. That they came back and they can't understand. They have an idea, but they can't understand why he's not himself. He is himself. What you don't realize is this is the person that he had to become in order to even come back. To survive, yeah, man, just yeah. to get through. Yeah, And right, so, right. you know, what happens, though, is a lot of times there's no mechanism. And, I, and, and, and being honest with you, I, I don't know if there really is a mechanism to make you go back to what you were before. I don't think that you ever would be what you were before. I think that you could be a productive member of society and go and move on, but you're never going to, you, you could never unsee what you've seen. Yeah. You could right. never undo what you did. You can learn to live with it, but uh, uh, everything you do in life changes your perception of life. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't want to get too deep into it, but that basically. No, but thank you, man. That's uh, a beautiful song. I love that's, that's, that's I love what that song. That's what Too Deep is about. Yeah, yeah I love that song. Thank you. Uh, and it's funky. Because everything's every yeah, good, it's man. Totally old school, man. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking like Curtis, old school like Curtis Mayfield. Oh, now, see, now, you, now, now, now you know. <laughs> because, you know, as a blues guy and soul guy, I kept saying, like, the blues has been, and me no disrespect, because we're on a, uh, a great guitar show. It, it had become more rock. There's so much of the rock stuff. I said, no one, no one's doing this. Where's the, 
Where's the Tyrone Davis? Where's the Arab King? Where's the the Johnny Taylor? Where's the where's the the Bobby Blank? Where's the Soul? Where's you know, the Bobby Womack? No one's doing that. These guys yeah. are blues cats. Yeah, soul cats. Yeah. You know, and and I made the mistake. Or I made the mistake. I was lucky enough when I did the album "The World We Live In" with the Italian uh, the Royal Italian the Royal Italian Brotherhood, and uh, one of the guys I think from the Deftones helped those guys out. And when I did that album, which is I think is the best album I've ever did, uh, I was just like, man, this is this is the sound I've been looking for. It's almost gospel, it's soul, it's and so I came back and it was funny because I you know, I was with Rick Booth and Trepid Artist and I was standing in front of the Orpheum Theater, right there on Beale Street, and I was supposed to go in and, and sit in with my friend Del Toro Richardson. And I had just came back off a world tour. Literally, but I promised that I was coming to Memphis and judge and all that. So I came off a world tour, went right there, flew, didn't go home, flew from Europe right there. So I'm standing there and literally, I mean, I got circles around my eyes. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a clean suit. I'm dressed to nice. I'm standing on the corner of Orpheum and I'm looking at my wife like, I can't go in. <laughs> I just, I just want to go to the hotel. I can't go in. Uh, and uh, Rick walks up and is like, hey, sugar, and they're talking to me. He's like, hey, I got this cat. I want you to introduce to you. At the time, I had two other blues contracts uh, in at, at hand about to go and do a blues album, or just a regular, you know, straight ahead blues album. But I just finished that where we live in thing, and I was like, man, I really love the way that was going. Like this is, this, I said, no one's really. And then I found, you know, about Sharon Jones, Charles Bradley, and Lee Fields, and and, and literally pretty much, pretty much there's just me and Lee Fields. And, well, you had those. What's that kid that did the song? All my favorite colors. Uh, they blew up there just just a year ago or a year before. Uh, I can't give his name right now. But you know now you know Fantastic Negrito, you know, me, a few others, and you know we're really pushing the boundaries of the or they say you're pushing the boundaries of the blues and and I'm like really man just be Have yourself. You, yeah, well no, but it's just what happened is I mean no disrespect you had a lot of. 60s, 70s rock guys come into the blues, and somehow or another that became, if you weren't playing rockish guitar, then you weren't a blues band for some reason. And I just then, you know, it's like in the blues world, they they almost got rid of all of us just singers, you know. Think about yeah. it. The way things well, yeah, were going 15 years of... ago, Bobby, if Bobby Bland had been born now, he wouldn't even have had a chance. Yeah, uh, man, um, sadly, you're right. But it's true. Yeah, yeah. it is 100% true. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, it's chance, been my man. mission to... To bring that back to the blues, that that gospel, soul, jazzy uh, sound, back to the blues world because it is part of blues. And the funny thing is, the black young black folks and, and middle aged black folks have really responded to it. So my audience has really become half and half. Which people come to that like, black people came back to the blues. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. Black people like uh, they like a lot of things, but they really love that that vocal. Horn B three, you know what? Oh, the B three is like magic, man. When you get a good yeah, B three, that's it. that's. You gotta have it. Yeah, I'm, broke. Broke. <laughs> I, I'm broke. I'm coming around with horns and a B three and get to a big. But when I walk on that stage, especially if I'm at a festival, blues, jazz, uh, we do folk festivals. We it's kind of weird. They put us in all these different things, you know. But the overwhelming response when we done is just people just sitting there like, I said, well, yeah, because if I'm doing a six to five minute show, a seven to five minute show. It's not twenty guitar solos. Yeah, well, plus I know you, you, your work ethic. You're like one hundred and ten percent all the way the whole show. Well, you have to entertain. Yeah, and and it seems to me that people have stopped entertaining. And there's a difference between playing great and sounding great and and entertaining. It's a skill. Yeah, it's oh, a skill, and it's a deliberate, I, I intentional don't call skill. A skill I, but yeah, okay. Yeah. No, it is, man, because you have to be deliberate, and you have to be intentional about your actions, and you have to understand why you're doing something to get the kind of response you need to get. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a skill. You got another track on, on to, In Too Deep, Please Take My Hand. I yeah. really like that track. It was like a protest anthem, I thought, almost. It was a great yeah. blues gospel song. Um, it was heavy, too. I bear these scars, and I wear these scars. What's, yeah. Tell me the backstory to that one, man. Again, Eric Corn, man, uh, and I told Eric, you know, this was like when all that, this was like right at the beginning of all this Black Lives Matter stuff and all that, and uh, Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, all lives matter. But I understand what the black, I understand what the Black Lives Matter people are trying to say. Don't mean that 
I think that they went about it in my mind the correct way, but they did do something. Okay. Having said that, um, I told Eric, I said, um, you know, it's been this way for a lot of people. And not whether it be black, white, Jewish, Italian, you know, let's face it. Our country doesn't have the best track record uh, with dealing with people that are not of uh, straight uh, Caucasian color, right? Yeah. I would say that. And, and that includes Jews, Italians, uh, you name it. But I wanted, I always wanted something when I, I told him, I said, I'm at this point now where I really don't give a damn what people think, and, and I'm a right, and I'm a sing about, because I also have this rule in my life. I never sing anything that I haven't lived. Not one song have I have ever sang on any album that you will find, whether it be something that I have not lived. That's, I don't sing crap just to sing crap. That's cool. And and uh, sometimes it got me in trouble, uh, but overall, that way I can defend everything that I've, I've sang on. And so the song was to bring out bring a light on things, but also make sure that we're bringing unity. This whole album is to put everything right up in everyone's face. But it, but at the same time, I want to say, you know, but we're still brothers, you know, talk to me. You know, instead of zooming, instead of getting your info from it, talk to me. Yeah, but that's a you tough know? thing on both sides because I, I, my perception, because people get caught up in herds. And they all feel they got to choose a side. And when it's like, you know, you're a Yankee fan. Oh, if you like the Boston Red Sox. And, of course, it's not as much heavier than that. But, you know, I won't even talk to a Red Sox fan or something like that. And I think that's what makes it tough. But what you said is, man, you got to have – it's like if you have an argument with your wife. Man, you can be an asshole and say, hey, man, I'm not going to talk to her for a day. That's not really going to be effective for your relationship. And it's not effective for any relationship. Man, you got to be able to talk. And and just just be be you know just learn and I don't know be open I don't know maybe I'm but well, it, it, you know it's what I what my grandma taught me there's a thing about civility and uh, I I say civility and so you know that is the the ability to sit down and we may not agree but, but at least have yes. the ability to sit down to listen to each other's arguments Dude. we're never all going to agree that's what makes America great but that's okay. But again, that's Ooh. what makes America great. This this is what makes us better than the Russians and right. But God, the, the London, uh, you know, and that's not being a capitalistic, like imperialistic mindset. It is what makes America great is that you can have those voices of dissent, but actually take that and come out on top. If everybody's believing the same thing all the time, the soon the lady just gonna run into the ground. Yeah, the, the totally. diversity of America is what has always made America great. Yeah. And we keep trying to get away from that and keep trying to censorship what people say. And that's not, that's not the American way. But we have lost the ability to have civility to one another. I think that's so important what you're saying. And I and that's why I hate social media, because people can't be civil on there. If If you're on an opposite side of the fence and it all comes to politics, which I don't understand because... I never talk about politics because it's not something I know. I only try to talk about things I know. I know right. music. I kind of know people. I know marketing. Like, I don't know politics. I can't. And most people don't know politics. No. Yet, but it doesn't stop. Which is from, why they always, <laughs> jank, always blame the president for memory deals. Which doesn't uh, stop him from talking really, about it. The president really, he has power, but he doesn't really have power to do certain things. The, the things that are actually bothering you in your everyday life, the president really can't do. Yeah, right. That's not going to. Right. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And on on either side, and on either I, side. <laughs> that's the thing, man. It's interesting you said that because that civility has been lost, and even in it little is. micro levels, you know, nobody holds the door open for. Well, you know, I do, and my son will. I, <laughs> I do know, too, and drive, my kids it's still do. Drive my wife crazy now that I carry her bags or something. She like, babe, I can carry my bags. I say, you know, after thirty years, you, you don't realize that I know you're the strongest person I know. I know you can carry your bag. That's that's it's not the thing. Not, it's like yeah. I was raised with civility because I'm your man. I'm going to carry your bag. I'm, I do it's the not same. not that you can't. Right. It's not that you can't, but allow me to be a man. And right. don't, 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 don't make, don't try to make me a man when it's a situation that suits you 100%. Let me be who I am. Yeah. And I will let you be who you are. And we'll be together till we both pass the break. Right. But right. People have loved, and that's just in the micro cosmo of being married. Yeah. But in the in, in America in general, we've lost this this ability to sit down and disagree yeah. uh like grown people. 
Yeah. And then it's like, you don't believe what I'm saying or you don't concur to what I'm saying, then we can't talk. But then how does that solve anything if you only work with people that believe what you believe in? Then then you're only solving half of the problem. And if you do that, you only come up with half the answer. You know? So it, it's I, gonna be, that's, a, that's like having a car with four wheels on it, but the wheels are only on one side. You ain't going nowhere. Yeah. No, man, <laughs> you know I... Mean? It, I, I attribute a lot of that to social media because I, people take a side and they're going to show you how important that they're going to defend that side to that. They may not know the first freaking thing about it, but they're going to defend it to the death and they're going to be an asshole to everybody else who doesn't agree with them. Okay. If that's what you want to do, I don't know. I don't think that's that productive. For, forget exactly. about for inner relate, relating with us. It's not productive for yourself because you're walking around angry all the time. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you, man. And then you have the you have the fact that social media. It, this is a capitalist country, and it's always about the dollars. And they found a way to make the algorithms give you exactly what you want, which is yep. why you just find that fall down further, further, further down that rabbit hole instead of taking the time to go out and actually read something or look at a certain a second uh, point of view. And actually, uh, the civility and the ability to self think have really eroded. Yeah, I mean, critical uh, thinking. I agree with you, man. The critical thinking, thank you. Yeah, has really I agree eroded, with you. Uh, in America. But, you know, we were taught at, at home and in school. They've kind of taken all that away. And so... Yeah, it used to be learn, question everything. Now it's like, don't question anything. Like, don't question what? anything. Yeah. Whatever they say is true. <laughs> where, where we grew up was literally our parents, because our parents came from an era where they realized that. Like, you question everything. Absolutely. What they say it may be true, but don't take things on face value. Research. Yeah. Before you open your mouth, yeah, and nothing, it's, nothing in this world is more stupider. And I said it that way on purpose. Right, than an educated fool. Yeah, man. And now it's worse because the internet. There's no barrier to entry. So, like my young, my youngest is 22. Uh, she just turned 23, and she'll she'll say, "Hey, Dad, so, tell me something." And I said, "Where'd you get that from?" She goes, "Oh, I learned it on TikTok." I'm like, "No, you didn't learn it. You just watched it. it you watched it. It doesn't you mean didn't learn it, a nerd you, thing. You got to realize it. There's 500 other people saying the opposite on TikTok. You, you got to yeah. just investigate, read some books, you know, get educated on stuff. Yeah, man. And that's what I do with, with, with my son. I, you know, even though he's he's way smarter than I am, educated young man and all this, but. Uh, it, I wanted to make sure that he understood you grew up in a, a digital age, but just because 20 people are saying this or 100,000 people are saying that on Twitter or Instagram or whatever platform, and I mean no disrespect to any of them. Remember, that's like being on the news or being on what you call it. That's, what, that's their opinion. Right. Now, now, take that if you want to and really research it on several different platforms. And, and my son, was like, he would leave Twitter and go to Instagram. I'm like, no, 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 no. I say, you know, this way America works. He's like, what do you mean, Dad? I said, there may be 300 companies. I said, and, and this is not a conspiracy theory. If you go libraries and read, you realize this. There may be 300 companies. He's like, yeah. I said, but the more you read, the further you go back, you realize there might up being five companies that own the, the other two, uh, 295. Right. So even though you're getting it from different sources, you're basically getting it from the same source. I said, this is why you have to go outside of regular and learn and then bring it back so you have a rounded. And I say, if you don't have stability, then you're always only believing that one side. Yeah. And not saying that one side is wrong, but you're but only seeing one opinion. Make a, deci make so a there, informed there be, decision. There may be four different ways of doing it. Yeah. Right. But if you only listen to that one side, you're, only, you're limited to that one way of doing it. No. Which may get the job done, but had you listened to this side over here, you may have been able to get the job done and drive your Cadillac. Or listen to this side. You may have been able to get the job done, drive the Cadillac, and have a big legged woman. You yeah. see what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you have woman, to, there you go. You, you have, yeah, to have this ability to, to listen. And that don't mean, again, and I say this from the stage now because I've gotten older. And so I'm, I'm always about unity. I'm always about bringing people together. But I say this from, from the stage. Civility is the ability to listen to someone who don't agree with you. There's agree, nothing man. wrong with having a good, heated conversation. And people say, well, it's an argument. No, there's still between an argument and a conversation. A, a heated conversation is people yelling at the top voice, but we're listening to each other, and yeah. we're responding to uh, 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 as, 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 as smart as we can. We're responding to what they're saying on that side. But listen, an argument is, people, is two people yelling over each other, and no one's listening to the other. That, that's that. There's yeah. a big difference in that. Huge. That's what we have in Congress now. 
we have arguments. But we used to have shouting matches. Right. You know, but they were listening to one another. Now it's even there, there's no civility. They just talking over, you know, it's, it's, it, well, it's and that has trickled all the way down to like your five year old kids. And now there's a lot of, what I don't like is there's a lot of judgment. Like if you don't agree with somebody, well, you judge him or her. Like that doesn't, I don't get that. Like just because you have a, I don't agree with my yeah. wife with everything. I'm not going to judge her for it. She's yeah. allowed to have her yeah. opinion. You're, I mean, that's but what. But that's why we have, to, yeah. we have, that's why Craig, we have to raise our children to be grown women and yeah. grown men. And yeah. What does that mean? Being a grown man means sometimes you may have to walk a path by yourself. Yeah, totally. That's your conviction. Yeah. You know, it's not always about being in the freaking in crowd. Yeah, right. You're man. a grown man. You're a lone wolf anyway. You're a grown woman. You're a lone wolf. Anyway. Yeah, totally. No grown woman wants three other grown women in her house. <laughs> it, it, right. it is what it is. I, yeah, let's man. stop playing all the games. No grown yeah. man wants the same thing. Yeah. So that means that there may be times when you have to walk away from people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And 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 just because someone you meet someone doesn't mean that they're your friend. Even if you agree, you agree and you get along, it, it again people have stopped raising children and start playing with children. I agree with you. It's a, it's it goes a back to again, I, I'm I'm your parent. I'm not your friend. Yeah. My job is to raise you so that you become a productive human being. You, you're smarter than you know the corporation just wants you smart enough to help to push that button. Yeah. I want you smart enough to know why this button being pushed and why and what, where's the money that they're making off of that so you can get a, a piece of that also. Yeah. So you're not always caught up in this corporate slavery that America has gone into it where it's all bias and bias and bias and, and we don't build crap anymore. Yeah. That's all because of civility. And there's always a push. Listen, America, it is America. We're a capitalist country. Yes. There was a problem. Whenever there's a problem in this country, get past the social crap, get past the political crap, get past the racial crap. There's one color in this country. The color is green. Green. Everything yeah. else is a fog <laughs> so that somebody else can make the green. And yeah, that, that once you get to that realization, you, yeah, you're man. pretty much good. I agree with you on that 100%. Yeah. So that's all so, the other black, white, white, black, Jew, and all that. All that crap is just a distortion. It's, yeah, it's just, yeah, I agree with you, man. It's smoke screen. It's, it's, it's one color. I don't care if you're black, white, Jewish. There's one color. If you got money, you green. Yeah, man. Yeah. Pretty, Sadly pretty. true. It's true. Um, thank you, man. That was cool. Tell Sorry me, about uh, that. I, say, I get a little long winded, dude. No, man. <laughs> T tell me, you have a worst gig ever story? Not really, man. Because I've always been happy. I, 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 I saw you. I, I read those last night for the first time, and I was like, the, the only thing I would say with worst gigs. I, 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 have, I, I have three I'll put in there. There was once I was playing in Plattsburgh, New York. That's and way the I, hell upstate. That's cold yeah. as shit up there. Yes, it yeah. is. I had 103 fever. Uh, the, oh. the girl that puts it on is a medical professor. She came check me out. I'm sitting out in the van. I'm shivering. I'm pouring sweat like I always sweat on stage. I got 103 fever, and I have to be on stage in an hour. I've done that before. And I go up there, and she said one of the best shows she's ever seen. The band was like, we didn't know you had a so that, but, but, but for me, I was I was hurt. The, the other one is I was in Tucson, Arizona, the day after knee, knee, knee surgery, I had a gig. Oh, man. And I remember sitting there with my knee the size of a watermelon. And uh, then the day after that, they inducted me to the Arizona Hall of Fame. I remember that. I was in the, in the, in the rhythm room. <laughs> Congratulations. But, you know, as far as worst gigs, it's always been uh, just because I was sick, but I've always enjoyed playing. Sometimes it's been, you know, crazy to get there. I think one of the weirdest, one of my, I've had a lot of weird ones, but like, let's say like uh, one time I was leaving Phoenix and I had to play in France and I usually try to get in the day before because you just never know what's going to happen. And I, I, I had got bumped up the first class and uh, uh, there was something wrong with the playing and we waited, we waited, we waited that day. We waited, couldn't get out. So then they put us on, had us debarked the plane. We got onto another plane that was across, uh, the, the terminal was literally right across, like we were in 3C, they had us go out in 4B, which was like right across. So we go over to 4B, they load us all up. Uh, they take away my first class seat and put me in a, <laughs> put me in a, uh, uh, whatever the seat was. 
and we taxi down the runway, and just when we get to the point where the wing, but the front wheels are about to lift off the ground, we hear this boom, boom, crack. Ding. The plane comes to a stop. No one comes on the radio. No one says anything. Finally, about thirty minutes into the guy tight, we have a mechan- mechanical failure, and wow. uh, they're coming to tow us back to the. They were towing us back to the terminal. Oh. So they're like, well, we can't get out today. I'm like, crap. So come back tomorrow. And I'm like, dude, I got a show, you know, <laughs> you know. So I we come back the next day, and somehow or another they I took me some way that I wanted to have to have like three or four stops or three stops to get where I was going. I landed somewhere in France, uh, landed, they picked me up. I literally did a five, six hour van ride, got out of the van, literally got out of the van. They handed me a, uh, they handed me a wet cloth. I washed my face. I walked up on the stage, did an hour and a half show. Wow. Signed CDs, kiss babies, walked off the stage, took a quick shower. They let me take a quick shower because it was the only time I had. Took a quick shower, drove me six hours back to the airport, got on a flight, and did that all the way back home. Oh, my God. So that's that's happened a few times in my career. Ah, that's rough, Literally, man. literally, literally walk off the plane, walk on stage, <laughs> walk off the stage. And go right back, back on, on the plane. plane. That's a, yeah. hey, man, that's a young man's game, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I don't, hey, I think we have to do that, not even a young man. It's just that's the way it was, you know. But you know, when you you build your name, you know that's no. That's, you got to say yes to everything. You have part to part of the game. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Ray. Tell me your top three Desert Island discs. Oh man, I saw that just that's for this tough, moment, dude. I, I know that is, P- that is tough. There's so much music I love. I know. Well, wait. When you, sh- number one and number two isn't so bad. Then when you get to number three, there's some people are sweating. Then, dude. You know, I'm a big fan of uh, Steely Dan. Okay. I like that sound. Uh, there's this great band called Loose Ends from Britain from back in the day. Okay, that that would definitely be with me. And then, and then it's like Jesus, man. How do you how do you not use Prince or Rick James or Marvin Gaye or? How come every time Baby I hear King. Rick James, I always think of Rick James? I'm Rick James, bitch. That has like I, I per- know, permeated I into society, man. Dave, Dave, Dave Chappelle, Chappelle, Dave Chappelle killed Rick's uh, his, I, I, his, his uh, his what he was looking for his uh, uh, autobiography because that's how people know is I'm Rick James. I mean, that guy was a freaking he was a freak, but he was a freaking genius also. Yeah, right. I mean, was. who else who else could write a, a hit for uh, Eddie Murphy? You know, Tina Marie. Uh, the Mary Jane girls and, and everybody in between. Uh, man, that that one that one's tough because then you know I, I'm a big fan of Maurice White, Earth Wind and Fire, and I'm a I'm a huge fan of Parliament. Uh, oh yeah. And, and let's not even talk about some of the blue stuff that I do. Not yeah, that would be hard for me, brother. That 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 yeah. I I, I get yeah loose ends. Still then I can see that uh, just because that's outside the the. Uh, the, my main variety, you know what I mean? Just give me a little, those, those give me a little bit of variety, uh, in, in some, but I, I, that's good. That's good. I, you, I, I, I would, I was, I would have to go with Earth, Wind, and Fire, bro. Okay. Cause that would give me a, that would give me enough. I mean, Earth, Wind, and Fire was so musically and vocally varied that I don't think that it, it would take a while for me to get bored with any one of their albums. Yeah, their that's albums true. Within themselves. Yeah. Or so, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot the same going thing on with there. Steely Dan. That's what I think about with Steely Dan. Steely Dan, you know, they're so, you know, from song to song, you're kind of like, what the, you know, how do yeah, you jump that to that? You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. I get you. Yeah, I, I have to say that. Uh, those would be my three for right now. That may change if you ask me in five minutes. Oh, yeah, right. It's just for right now. Of course. <laughs> oh, of course. Right on. Uh, this is a tough one. What do you like and dislike most about yourself? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I like that I about myself is I pretty much love all people. Uh, I think uh, I pretty much love, I mean, like I said, I'm one of those people that I, I like everyone until you give me a reason not to like you. Yeah. Unfor- I, unfortunately, I, some people do that quickly. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I'm I'm one of them big. I'm a big. I'm a big giant teddy bear, and I and I really do love everybody. That's cool, uh, man. Like, I said, too, like what I dislike about myself, but it, I, you know, I. I mean, everybody can stand improvement. Lord knows, I can I can stand some improvement, but I don't know if it's a quote unquote dislike. That's fair. 
you know. I mean, there are things in my life that I would like to, to improve myself upon, which I'm always striving to try to do that. But it's not like it's a dislike because I'm still on this side of the grass and I'm not viewed as a nasty person. So I yeah, think I've man. done most You're, things o yeah. okay. Okay. I feel but there's, you, always, there's always room for improvement. I like that. I'm still on this side of the grass. I like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm country. They come out sometimes. Too. No, that's awesome, bro. I love <laughs> stuff like that. I, I, I write it down and I put it in my own storehouse. You know, then I got it, <laughs> and I and I could I use it on someone else. Um, toughest decision you had to make, Ray, or the most difficult thing you had to do. Well, I don't even. You know, if I feel comfortable uh, saying the, saying that on 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 the air, maybe, that's fine. Maybe one day when we, we get together and, and we're smoking and, cigars and, and drinking, yeah, <laughs> um, because you know, I, I, I've lived a I lived a lot of life. And Good between the ghetto, the country, the military, and traveling the world. So there's some things that yeah. you know not everybody needs to. You know, when I'm dead and gone, they can talk about them. You know, yeah. Uh, um, well, I'm glad yeah. you said that. I'm glad you didn't yeah. say something that made you uncomfortable. Yeah. Tell me, man, the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and has this change been intentional or just a natural part of aging? Both. Uh, like I said, when I finally had the epiphany that I was the best me that there is, that's that's huge. And I'm not saying I was the best person in the world. That's, no. I won't yeah. be bothered. Understand what I'm saying? When no, you I, got liberated, man. You, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah when I, I realized that the way I'm doing it, this is the best that I'm gonna be. I'm the best. Me, I'm the best. What? Well, it, it was kind of like when I was doing a lot of covers and when it came about uh, before I started doing a lot of original stuff, and it was like, why be a really? You know, you'd rather be. Uh, how would how did put it? How Jim put it? He said, "Why be a really good copy of somebody else?" And uh really bad original yeah it's better to be a bad original or, or a bad copy of somebody else than a good original yeah and I, what i mean by that is you you realize the Marvin gay and all these great songwriters they were just being themselves that would make them yeah who they are so why try to copy what someone is doing how about that you know further the craft further the the conversation further the intellect further the whatever by adding your two cents to it. Now, not everybody's going to agree it with that. Not everybody's going to be uh, a multi, quadruple, million person, voiceless, you know, but maybe those 10,000 or 15,000 that think like you think will will be happy that you voiced, voiced their opinion also. Yeah. That it, their, their opinion got to go into the firmament. So it's better to be a really good version of yourself or even a bad version of yourself than a really good or bad version of a copy. I agree with you. I'm glad you're feeling yeah. that way. And, and I, you know, I had that epiphany, and, and one of the things that helped me lead, lead me to that was listening to an Albert King interview somewhere in Europe or wherever he was, and they don't play it that often you have to dig for. And some band was playing, and they were playing an Albert King song. And the reporter or the interviewer asked Albert King, so what do you think? Uh, about these guys playing your song. And Alba King did this backhanded thing that was so cool that the old brothers used to do. He said, he was smiling with his pipe. He was like, man, those guys are great. He said, those guys are so good, they even played my mistakes. Now, most people miss that. Oh, wow. That wow. fell on me like a ton of bricks. Yeah, man. Wow. Did, did, did you get that? Yeah, that's heavy, man. It's like they, they did nothing original, even my mistakes they copied. Yeah. Yep. Wow. He said, those guys are so good, they even played my mistakes. He was smiling the whole time with his pipe on. Wow. But I knew exactly what he meant. Interesting. That is, yeah, that's a pretty that's clever. Deep. Yeah, that's a very <laughs> clever. Yeah, that was clever as hell, man. Yeah. Wow. And I, what, like who, I said, I, what, I don't think the, what, I don't Where think can I find interview that was, interview? Dude, you'd have to dig for that. That's like that was like one of those rabbit hole nights years, decades ago. And, uh, do you know what country? Albert King. Albert King. I got it. I'm gonna look for that, man. And they were interviewing him from somewhere, and someone that was playing, some band was playing one of his songs. Wow, 
Yeah, I've got, I'm a huge Albert King fan. I love his music. I love his playing. Uh, last question, bro. And I got to tell you, thank you so much for thank you for being you, man. Because I really enjoyed you. Thank you. No man. worries. Sorry, I, sorry for being so long winded, bro. No, you keep apologizing. You're just telling some good. St- you can never be too long. Only too boring. And you're not boring at all. So, uh, thank you for everything. What's the thing in your life, Ray, that's either making you happiest or giving you the most satisfaction or excitement right now? It's still my wife, and, and that's not a that's not a that's not a cop out. I mean, really. I mean, no, that's beautiful. I've man. never had anyone in my life other than my grandmother that had my back one hundred percent. That's I'm really happy without, for you, man. Without any crap, that means that you know. My wife is also the one like, don't you ever see that song again? That was horrible. Don't you ever wear <laughs> that again? And I know that when she tells me something, it's not. There's no malice in it. It is course, literally yeah. to help me. Yeah, yeah. Man, so, you know what? I just hit thirty years with my wife, and I feel the same way. Exactly right on, the bro. same way, man. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Lucky, very, we, very lucky. So we got married in 2004, but we've been together since like '97. That's a long time. That's yeah. 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, that's long. Yeah. Twenty seven. No, no, it's longer than that. Yeah, it's longer than that. It's nineteen seventeen, nineteen seventy, two thousand ten, two thousand seven, two thousand. It's twenty six yeah. years, I think, right? Twenty six years. Yeah, yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. You're right behind me, man. That's right, awesome, right brother. There, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, let me tell people where they could find you online. Uh, okay, check out. It's uh, Sugar Ray Rayford. It's S U G A R A Y Rayford. dot com. That's um, it. He's got a his website is really cool. It's very built out. Uh, also, you can find Ray on social media. He's also got a, a big. Sp- if you're on Spotify, follow him on Spotify, please. That would be great. And that would be really helpful to support him. You could uh, follow him on Instagram and Facebook. Um, starting March 10th, they're going uh, to. He's going to finally get to tour into Deep, which was the album that we were talking about. Those tracks that came from the last album that came out in uh, 2022. Why don't you talk about where you'll be playing, Ray? Well, the very first show is uh, uh, March the 10th coming up, and that's in uh, Walla Walla, Washington, the Walla Walla Guitar Festival. And um, and then from there, we're going down to the Winter Park Music Festival um, in Oaks Grove, Oakland, the next day. Oregon. I keep saying Oakland. Then, of course, I get to play here in uh, Arizona at the Rhythm Room uh, here in Phoenix, and uh, then the next day after that, uh, Goodyear Lakeside, and then we really start running uh, – Literally, I think the week after that, we're in Curacao. Wow. Uh, for the International uh, Blue Seas Festival. With those guys are part of the, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I always forget the name over there in, in, in uh, uh, the jazz festival. It's a big jazz festival. But anyway, we'll be in Curacao uh, for about four days uh, doing that. And then we'll come back home for literally, uh, I think it's like eight, nine days, and then we heard, head back to Bern, Switzerland for the uh, Bern Jazz Fest, and we'll be doing that five nights in a row. So we'll be there uh, for five nights. That's awesome. Uh, playing that one. And so we got a lot of international stuff in, in Breshov and then all over the United States. We're coming out to New York. We're coming out to, to Philly. We're going up to Canada. We have shows in Cincinnati, Ohio, Minnesota, uh Utah, blah, blah, blah. so you know they 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 have me running, man. They, they, awesome. It's, it, it's that right now their shows booked all the way out to twenty twenty five. So we're we're happy about where everything is That's going. That's great, man. And, I'm and really happy. Rolling. But we're coming to a city near you, and I'm also except happy Florida, <laughs> except, except Florida. I, you know, but I, I think I think it'll change. I mean, we have a uh, we have uh, the Chicago Blues Festival, which I'm really. That's it's been my bucket list festival, and and they awesome. have me on the main stage, not one of the side stages, which is, which is really cool. I'm, well I'm, deserved. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, you know, that's I awesome. Man. I'm, I'm just hey, Chicago guys, thank you guys for giving the old Texan slash California the chance. So I appreciate. Yeah, that. man. <laughs> but, where, where are you playing in the city in New York? Where are you playing? Do you know? Oh man, I have looked that up. I know we, we're going to upstate to upstate New York, and I had it on here. And they just booked it. I'm trying to look on this, what you call it, here, and it's not there. Oh, no worries. So, just curious. But going to the website, it'll, I'll be there. Not everything's here. I'm really also excited about doing the Blues Cruise again, too. So we'll be doing that one on the Holland America out, out of San Diego in October. And, uh, you know, I know my, my keyboard player, my MD, uh, just did some shows with Walter Trout. So he just did the Blues Cruise, and then he just did the, uh, the Rock Cruise, the Rock and Roll Cruise, you know, him and the guys from the Who. Uh, his best buddy Frank is the MD for the who's been their MD for a long time. So 
We just, oh, uh, uh, what's that guy? Frank? I know who you're talking Frank. about. I yeah. can never remember Frank's last no, name. No, I had him I on the Frank. show here a long time ago. I know who you're yeah, talking Frank about. Frank good people. Yeah, Frank I know good who you're people. talking about. Kind of quiet. Yeah. You start speaking Japanese to him, then he'll, he'll really. <laughs> you, know. you know, he's half Japanese. I don't know if you know that. I, yeah. I knew he lived there for a while, actually. I yeah, think. he did. He told yeah. me that. I think it's his mother or his father. I have to ask Frank. But for Frank, you know, when I get up, whenever I get to L.A., me, me Drake, and Frank get together and have lunch and stuff. He just, he just cool people, man. That's cool, cool man. Cat. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of touring up through Canada, Calgary, Ottawa, uh, I think Montreblanc. Uh, so we're just getting back out there, and I'm, I'm gonna be, and of course, as always, I'm always doing songs from all the albums. But we're gonna do at least six to seven, six to seven songs off of uh, Into Deep to really That's great. Uh, give it give it opportunity because, like I said, between the COVID and everything else, we really didn't get a chance to tour it. But now, now, baby. It, it, Watch out for the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. Baby. There you this go, man. Ray for bad. And let me <laughs> let me get shouts out to 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 Drake, to to Alan Markell, to Ramon Michelle, to Danny Avila, to uh, uh, my uh, Julian Davis, and to uh, DJ Martin. Those cats, my bandmates, who uh, uh, backed me up. And big shouts out to Eric Corn from Forty Below Records for continuing believing in me. Uh, we're starting to work on the new album, and uh, we got one more album together under our contract. Hopefully. Uh, we'll do some more because uh, I think I have, I've had a lot of success with uh, Eric Horn. And then uh, Patty DeVries, uh thank you very much. One of the best publicists in the world. And, uh, and She's uh, great. Craig, thank you, brother, for, for letting me be long with you. I appreciate it. Dude, you're the best. I'm looking forward to smoking a cigar with you when you come down here. Uh, well, I, I always got him on me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just hate to be worse cold. So <laughs> we, can find somewhere. we can find a place in Florida. It would never be cold here, bro. <laughs> Oh, well, that's hang, right. That's true. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up. Ray, thank you very much for everything. It's a pleasure talking to you, man. I wish you nothing but continued success, good health, and uh, you know, good vibes for you and your wife, man. So thank hang you, on man. one second. We'll wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share this on your socials with your friends. Thanks very much to Sugar Ray Rayford. Please check him out online. Uh, if he's coming to a town near you, this guy is a powerhouse, man. He's given 110%. Check him out in his show. Buy his CDs and support the band. Uh, and most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, have fun, and uh, we'll see you on the flip side, man. Until next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out.